Thanks for the kind introduction, Jared. Uh, as Jared mentioned, um, I, let's see, how does this work? Okay. Uh, I am a member of the faculty at this brand new campus of Cornell University. So for those of you that haven't heard of it, Cornell Tech is part of the greater Cornell University. It's currently located in the Google building in Chelsea in temporary space. And in mid-July, we're moving to that new campus that Jared mentioned. Uh, this is what the rendering looks like, um, and this is a more accurate representation <laughs> of where it is right now. Um, so soon we'll be packing our boxes and moving there. So uh, in this short talk, I'm going to cover two different things. One has to do with a problem called fine-grained category recognition, and I'll be using the example of bird species to motivate that. The second part has to do with a bit more exploratory data analysis, cases where you don't know exact categories, but you'd still like to browse visual data. So the Visipedia project is the theme that runs through this research. And the idea is that right now we take for granted the ability to do text searches. You can just think of pretty much any topic do a web search and you find all kinds of interesting information. Often it's on Wikipedia. But if you don't know what something is called, you just have a picture of a mushroom or some kind of disease on a plant, um, a bird, you don't know how to describe it, you don't know the technical terms, how do you find that answer? Now, um, as usual, XKCD has some uh, very interesting comic. You, you don't have to read this um, in detail, but the, the idea here is that when you're explaining things like AI outside of, of the, to people outside the field, it's hard to know what's easy and what's hard. And, and this, which became known as the bird or park or park or bird uh, comic strip, is pointing out that knowing whether someone took a photo in a national park is now considered easy. All right, it's really not, if you think about it, there's a lot that goes into making it easy, which is basically knowing where, you're, uh, where the geotag is, but knowing whether a photo contains a bird at the time that he wrote this comic was actually hard, and now it's considered easy, all right? The part that's considered easy is simply knowing that a bird is in the photo, but knowing which species of bird is actually still quite difficult, and that's the problem we're tackling. So bird is an example of what's known as an entry-level category, and pretty much everyone can recognize entry-level or basic categories, but you need some kind of expertise in order to classify the species. So the motivation behind Visipedia involves humans and machines working together. These are human-in-the-loop systems, and it's community-driven, and we're banking on the idea that there are large groups of people who are fans of different verticals or categories, super categories. So somebody might really be into lemurs or World War II era biplanes. And if you can find a way to organize their data in some visually appealing way, then you can create tools for this community and, and make it possible for them to recognize objects and, and share data and so forth. So uh, one of the things that we're leveraging here is that if you look at this task on the left, as I was saying, just knowing the basic level category is very simple. We all know that that's an airplane. It's not a chair, all right? So a lot of the very visible research that's going on in deep learning is operating at the basic category level. Now, the task B is hard for humans. Is that an indigo bunting? Is it a finch? It's hard to know unless you're an expert in ornithology or you're a, a birder. So if you break that down into simple questions, like is the belly blue? Is the beak black? Once you break it down into these simple questions in a sort of field guide fashion, then it becomes easy for humans. And this leads us to this notion of visual 20 questions. So you have some image that comes in, and it enters this mysterious block called computer vision. All right, so the totality of my field fits within that little block. Now, ideally, computer vision would just solve the problem. You put the image in, you get out some 
probability of the class of bird given the input image x. We'd like to see some big spike around the correct class and all the others would be tiny. But computer vision isn't perfect yet. So the idea with visual 20 questions is that you kick off a 20 questions game that uses the output of the computer vision block as a prior. So you're not doing 20 questions from scratch. It's not from a uniform prior. It's influenced by whatever the computer vision system was able to determine. In that case, you have a bag of possible questions that apply over all possible birds that have to do with the color of the beak. Uh, they can be part uh, locations. They can be attributes of parts. But it's a bag of about 300 possible questions. And we select them adaptively. So in this algorithm that, that is shown here, you reach into that bag of questions and you select the question that maximizes the expected information gain. And we do so in a greedy fashion. And in practice, you actually only need to do one or two of these answers to get a, a good classification of that bird. In terms of what's inside that computer vision block, we're using a certain kind of deep conf net that localizes the parts of the bird, the head, um, a sort of canonical representation of the body, as well as some context, which captures the foliage around the bird. And so this runs into uh, a deep convolutional neural network. And eventually, there's a softmax layer at the end, and you get a classification for the type of bird. This is actually running uh, now, and I'll, I'll show you a link to the app at the end. But here's a quick click through of, of what this looks like. Uh, originally, we had a, a soft launch with this web demo, and then we have it on iOS and Android now. So in the web demo, you would upload it. Uh, maybe you have a picture that has more than one bird in it. And the system localizes one of the birds, so you can select which one you want. In this case, it needs some help. And it asks, where's the, the beak? So click on the beak. So the user clicks on the beak, and, uh, and that's enough information for it. Uh, then if the geotag's not available, it'll ask you where the photo was taken. In that case, it accesses eBird, which is the data science back end of the system. And then it gets uh, a short list of possible matches. So you have this input image. It pulls up the short list, which in this case, uh, there was only one uh, item in the short list, and it was correct. Um, if you click on This Is My Bird, it will play the bird song. It will take you to a, a page that has information about that bird at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And most importantly, it puts it into a bucket in the cloud where the experts who coordinate this information at the Lab of Ornithology can add it back into the training data. So they can vet it and put it back into the system. Uh, it also enables them to use all of these app users as a big crowd sensing mechanism. So they can study bird migration, climate change, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, this is now available um, in both iOS and Android. Uh, so you can give this a try. And uh, I'll mention at the very end uh, some extensions that we're, we're doing to this that go uh, well beyond birds. Now, uh, so that concludes part one. Um, in that first phase of the talk, there was a crisp answer to these questions. So you had a visual query, and there was a correct answer for the species of the bird. In the second part, what we're interested in doing is capturing a notion of perceptual similarity. And there may not be a clear answer here, but there still are opportunities for us to make sense of how we organize visual information uh, through the human visual system. So in order to get at this, we're going to make use of this notion of triplets. So we're going to have A, B, and C. And some image, like the owl on the left, represents our anchor. And images B and C, another owl and another type of bird, represent these two options we have for matching to that anchor. So we're going to say, well, I may not know the name of the species of that bird. I'm not a bird expert, but I can tell that that image A looks more like image B than image C. So that's a kind of relative information that you can capture. You have an anchor. You have a set of comparisons. In this case, it's the minimal set of comparisons. And that gives you a little bit of information 
without any semantics, without knowing what's in the image, you can just collect this type of information. And we found that this was preferable to using something like a Likert scale, like in this case there's a five point scale where I say, uh, so this is a, a nod to Jared, we're showing pizza and a pizza-like thing. Um, so if you just present pairs of images to people and say, tell us, uh, answer this question. These two foods taste similar, how much do you agree? Well, okay, you give them that scale, but how are they calibrated? Uh, is it going to drift as you show them more and more images? So having that kind of absolute numerical scale is challenging. So anyone who works with recommendation systems, things like Netflix and so forth, uh, ranking, rating, all these things run into this problem. And so we just sidestep it completely. We say this is very complicated to make use of that sort of scale. So we instead use this notion of triplets. So with triplets, you're going to run into a complexity issue. If you have a very large set of entities and you want to capture these triplet-based similarities, there's a lot of triplets to select. Toward that end, we make use of a little trick that exploits the highly parallel nature of the human visual system. So the idea is you still use an anchor. So in this case, the anchor is the carrots that are shown on the left. But instead of just having two arms where you're comparing, you can actually show a grid. And here I'm just showing a grid of nine, but it can actually be much bigger. So when it comes to crowdsourcing this, you would think, well, how are you gonna get any benefit? Why not just show all the triplets that you could subsample from here? Well, I'm not an experimental psychologist, so I don't have a great answer for this, but somehow people don't mind being presented with this very large grid of images. We just say, we're going to show you the anchor, we're gonna show you N images, and we want you to click on K of them that are most similar. And whether we make it two by two, three by three, four by four, they're happy to do this, either on a volunteer basis or for a small payment on Mechanical Turk. And from there, we're able to harvest large amounts of these triplets. So you get big batches of triplets all at once, very, and it's very inexpensive. And from those clicked points, you're able to gather the data points that are near to you or the ones that are far. And from there, you're able to compute these so-called low-dimensional embeddings. Now let's go back to what I think is a bit more mainstream in terms of how people process visual data. What's much more common, so let's take the context of food or, or appetizers, like suppose we wanted to make a visual menu for a New York diner. So these days, you know, the standard menu, you open it up and there may be, may be hundreds of items and some of them have photos and some don't. But imagine that in the future we make some kind of augmented reality or virtual reality menu where the food is kind of arranged spatially and things that taste similar are near each other. Well, the dominant paradigm now with machine learning and images is often tied to supervised learning and these predefined classes. And if you've got the predefined classes, you'll probably do a good job. So if this looks like pho, then you can run it through that uh, deep convnet and, and get out that result. But sometimes there are subtleties that we don't really know um, how to capture. I mean, do these taste similar? Well, sort of, but one is frozen and you wouldn't want to bite into that. Here's something that might superficially look like guacamole. And you know, the visual features are very subtle in terms of capturing that. Or what category is this? Um, is this a, a candy? Is, does it count as Kit Kat? That would be quite a surprise if that um, ended up classified as Kit Kat. In fact, I'm not sure if that's real, but this is, okay, so that, that is real. Um, so sometimes these things defy predefined categories and we need to have some mechanism to go beyond what might be in that softmax output layer of a deep convnet. So this brings us to an algorithm that we developed which just happens to be called Snack. Uh, we were working with um, appetizers at the time. And it combines two techniques that some of you may have heard of before. One of them is known as stochastic neighbor embedding and that shows up in the, in the T-SNE algorithm uh, from van der Matten and Hinton. And the other part is crowd kernel embedding. So there are two parts of this. There's the human part and there's the deep learning uh, machine part. 
The machine part does the heavy lifting to try to sort through lots of data for you, and the humans just make use of a tiny subsample of the data. So the idea, let's go back to this notion of um, appetizers. Let's say we have 10,000 photos of appetizers, and we want to organize them into some kind of visual menu, a, a two-dimensional menu card. So you can produce, uh, you can make a, a ConvNet that's trained to do food classification, and instead of using that softmax output layer that tells you which kind of cuisine it is, you peel off that last layer and just use whatever features were going into that as a low level descriptor of that food. So instead of saying what type of food it is, I'm just gonna characterize it with some high dimensional vector. And that just becomes this, the machine's impression of what's contained within that image. So when I say heavy lifting, what I mean is for those 10,000 images, you can get those features cheaply. You can compare them all to one another. You can get some kind of notion of distance. But all those subtleties about wasabi versus guacamole and Kit Kats and, and so forth, that can be captured through the human expertise. So think of it like the stochastic neighbor embedding can be done completely automatically with the deep learn features. And then for maybe 1% or 0.1% of the data, you set up those grid stimuli and you get people to indicate their notions of similarity. You put these together into this blender, which is this weighted loss function, so that that human notion of similarity tugs on the embedding. So the machine generated embedding starts out with its best guess of where these foods should be located and then the human looks at some subset of them and influences what the appearance of that embedding will be. So that ends up producing this so-called concept embedding. And if you really zoom out, uh, you get this thing. This is an example of a visual menu. This is food 10K. And if you zoom in, you can see that you have things like waffles or pastries near one another. In other areas, you'll have pasta and noodles and so forth. And so this was the kind of thing you can get for just, say, $4 on Mechanical Turk, um, where you're just sampling a very small number of those possible triplets. Um, so that's an example of applying it to a, a, a menu uh, without semantics. You're not talking about the name of the cuisine, the name of the restaurant. It's just, how does it look? Does the taste appear to be similar? Uh, so it's a very visual experience. More quantitatively, you can use it for things like cleaning up labels in your data. So a group of ornithologists might make a data set uh, of birds, and even though they are experts, they might have made a labeling error. So what you can do is take your data set, ignore the labels, run it through this system, the snack system, and, um, and figure out to non-experts which birds look similar and which birds look different. And when you look through that, you might discover that there's an error inside that plot. So somewhere in one of the green clusters, there's a point that is a different color. And it draws your attention to this and you say, wait a minute, something was wrong. The people that looked at this thought it was a different bird. And when we zoomed in on it, um, okay, so there's an animation that was lost here. We zoomed in, and it turns out that that bird was labeled incorrectly. Okay, so it's the kind of thing where, um, where you can do a sanity check on quantitative labels just based on what the generic human visual system thinks when it sees one of those images. Uh, in terms of what's next for Visipedia, we have a challenge that, we're, uh, that we just launched uh, together with the developers of iNaturalist. And so this takes us from birds to uh, over a dozen taxonomic groups, uh, plants and animals. Um, so we're running a competition at the CVPR conference, which is in Hawaii in July. Um, so you can look up this competition. It's iNaturalist sponsored by Google. So there's 5,000 species here. So soon you'll be seeing something just like that Merlin app for birds but for all kinds of plants and animals. And you'll be able to just snap a photo and get a classification of it. And with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking Jared again, and then my students and, and collaborators on Visipedia. 
Uh, thanks for your attention.